says we're on. Okay, someone double check and let me know if we're on. So let me post the link on my Facebook page. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Can someone confirm? Yahweh name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I am again live streaming. Hold on. All right, in Jesus' almighty name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I assume it's on. You guys, can you check to see if the sound is good, the quality is good, by the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Before I even begin praying, I want to make sure. Okay, good. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Father, we again come before you in the name of Jesus, by authority of Jesus, and the love of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, and invoke you for the sake of your beloved Son, that by the power of the Holy Spirit you'll fill me again, Anoint me by your spirit to speak truth without error, to save me from stammering confusion, <clears throat> to strengthen my throat, my chest, and lungs, filling them with your breath of life, so that by your grace, by your mercy, by your love, you'll give me the health I need to do this and the holiness I need to delight your heart, because we love you, Father. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll fill everyone present with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom, knowledge, understanding, to know your war, word more in depth and guide me by your spirit to rightly handle the word of truth, saving me from error and misinterpretation and giving me the grace of your son to do it in a spirit of love, love for the glory and honor of your son and love for your people because we need you, Father. We love you. We need Jesus, your son, our Lord. We love your son and we need your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your spirit and we love your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Be with us and our loved ones. Cover us and our loved ones. In my case, my daughters and their mother. With the blood of Jesus, the holy blood of Jesus, the holy blood of Jesus Christ, that by the power of the blood of Christ, you will save us from attacks of the enemy. Have your way with us. Use my meager efforts to glorify you. We love you. We love the Lord Jesus. We love your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I was asked the question about the office of priesthood, right? Is that the question you want me to address right now? And then we'll go to Shabir. Shabir, Shabir. Michael, welcome, brother. Haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. A handsome face like mine. So, you guys are interested in me discussing the office of priesthood. Okay. Is there a basis in the New Testament for establishing an office of priesthood that's, that's distinct from the common priesthood shared by all believers? In other words, do we find anywhere in the New Testament where God has set up an office of priesthood distinct from the priesthood shared in common by all born-again believers the quick answer is absolutely not the quick answer is absolutely not so where does this come from well it comes from tradition so the quick answer is you will not find unlike what you find in the hebrew bible where god set apart aaron and his sons to be the high priest and the tribe of levi to serve in the temple you will not find you will not find in the new testament where the holy spirit inspires the authors to set apart a specific office occupied by some <clears throat> to be priests for the local churches of the lord jesus christ everyone with me there is that clear before i now proceed to the evidence you're not going to find it so then what do you find in the New Testament? Well, apart from apostles and prophets, when the apostles and prophets passed from the scene, after giving the church all the revelation that our Lord Jesus Christ wanted the church to have, what you find in connection with local congregations, assemblies of believers, are two specific offices, that of bishop and deacon. Let's look at it. Philippians 1, verse 1, as the Spirit fills me with wisdom, to handle the scriptures correctly for the glory of Christ. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, now watch here. Paul and Timotheus, Timotheus, Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Now, side note. The office of bishop is also called the office of elder overseer. 
A bishop is an elder, is an overseer. It, this refers to the same office. An elder is a bishop, is an overseer. So that's all you're going to find in the New Testament, apart from teachers, preachers, evangelists, right? These are the two main offices that you'll find in relationship to, in connection with the local church, the assembly of believers. Is everyone with me there? <clears throat> That's all you're going to find. Bishops and deacons. Now note what Paul does not mention. He does not mention bishops, priests, and deacons. Because an office of priesthood that's distinct from the priesthood shared in common by all believers does not exist in the New Testament. It's not a biblical teaching. Let's go to Titus 1 and read 5 all the way to 16. Titus 1 verses 5 to 16. Now, I know some people may not be interested in hearing this topic, but it's still an important topic nonetheless because we want to know what the Bible says concerning how the church is to govern itself and set itself up in a manner pleasing to our triune God, pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Don't you guys want to know? Let's go to Titus 1 verses 5 to 16, okay? Let's see what it says here. Titus 1, verses 5 to 16. For this cause left I thee in Crete, which is in Turkey, that thou shouldest set in order <clears throat> the things that are wanting. Now notice, ordain elders in every city. An elder is a bishop, is an overseer. It's the same office. As I had appointed thee. <clears throat> if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless. You see how elder and bishop are used interchangeably? So here the Apostle Paul is setting forth the qualifications of a bishop, slash elder, slash overseer. So a bishop who's an elder has to have been married only once, husband of one wife. Now it doesn't mean you must be married. What it means is to be a bishop, right, you can't have been married more than once, which is very difficult for those who are divorced, right? Because if you are someone who's divorced, let's say you, you're a believer, you got married to someone who's a professing believer, and then somehow your marriage didn't work out. Let's say your wife left you and abandoned the faith. D these passages become very difficult for such a person because on a surface level reading, the implication is because of that, either that person remains celibate if he wants to be an elder slash bishop slash, slash overseer because if he remarries, the plain reading of these passages seems to suggest that that person no longer qualifies to be an elder of the church of Jesus Christ. You see how serious marriage is? It's not a joke. You want to see that? Because it does a lot of damage spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. A lot of damage. Marriage is not a joke. Woe to those spouses, whether men or women, who decide, decide to dissolve the marital union because of their own wicked lusts and desires, not realizing the great judgment, discipline, damage that they bring, not just to themselves, but to their loved ones that they have abandoned. Woe to them. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on all of them. Now, let's read 7 again. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Notice a bishop doesn't own the church. He's a manager who manages the church. He's a steward. Because God owns the church. And he's not self-willed. It's not about his own desires. Right? Not soon angry. So he has to be patient. Not given to wine. He can't be a drunkard that likes revelry, drunkenness, partying. No striker. Not given to filthy lucre. It's not about money. But a lover of hospitality. You have to be very hospital, hospitable. A lover of good. Men, sober, clear thinking, clear headed. He has to be just. He has to be holy. He has to be temperate. Control his temper. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And I'll come back to verse 9 in a minute. For there are many unruly who won't submit to authority, can't be controlled, vain talkers and deceivers. Speaking about useless, vain things. Especially they of the circumcision. Especially those who are physical Jews. 
whose mouth must be stopped. So an elder has to have the ability to silence deceivers, vain talkers, unruly people, <clears throat> right? Silence them, shame them, expose them, rebuke them, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, right? They come and destroy homes, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, for money. They will whore themselves, prostitute themselves for money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, a fellow Cretan said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, notice an elder must be able to rebuke these vain talkers, these babblers, these deceivers, these money-hungry spiritual whores, right? Who subvert households and mislead people. An elder must be able to rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving to heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men, traditions that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. So they claim to know God, but their works they show they do not know God. They are liars, being abominable, and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Is that clear? Do you see the qualification of an elder slash bishop slash overseer? Now, for, for those elders that you know in your life that you've met, how many of them passed the test? How many of them should not be doing what they're called to do? Because they were not called to do it in the first place. Without mentioning names, I am sure, you know, elders locally that have no business being elders because they were not called to do so. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There are many elders who are called by the Spirit to be elders, and the Spirit qualifies them. So there are sound elders, sound bishops and overseers, because they have been raised by the Spirit and are kept by the Spirit. So glory to God, who will never abandon His church, who will make sure in His infinite power to raise up qualified leadership in every generation. They're there, because God is real, and He will not abandon His church, right? You with me there? But not everyone is qualified to be an elder. Now, I'm going to offend some. And I say this, and I pray I say this with pure motives. Lord Jesus, wash my heart, cleanse my motives to say this from love with no hate towards this man. I don't hate this man. God has healed my heart of any avarice I may have had towards him because of his attitude. But I can honestly tell you, one man who should not be an elder and I say this because I want people to hear this. This is public because he's a public figure. Like Paul rebuked Peter publicly when he strayed. James White has no business being an elder. He does not have what it takes. And in humbleness, he should step down. He should. That's my honest opinion. And it's not personal. I'm being honest to God. Right? He should not be an elder. And he uses that platform in order to give himself a credibility that he does not have his attitude his demeanor towards fellow christians he is disqualified needs to step down if he truly loves the lord may the lord convict him to accept this and humble himself and repent i have to be honest one second now does that mean does that mean i think i'm qualified to be an elder far from it my calling is to be a teacher and apologist to work under qualified elders, which by the grace of God, I gladly do in Jesus name. Just because you're an apologist, an elder is a bishop of the church, what you call a pastor. That doesn't qualify you to be an elder, right? So again, that's the qualifications of a bishop. Now let's go to 1 Timothy 3. Let's read verses 1 to 7. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7. There are only two offices connected with the local assembly of believers, what we call the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, notice qualifications for a bishop. Remember, a bishop is an elder and overseer. It's the same office. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Desireth a good work. It's good and noble if you want to be a bishop, provided that conviction is from the Holy Spirit. A bishop then must be blameless, 
the husband of one wife. Notice again, husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, and of good behavior. Given to hospitality. See, notice? The same instructions he gave to Titus, he's given to Timothy. Right? Apt to teach. He should be able to teach. Not given to wine. No striker. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. Not doing it for money. He has to be patient. Not a brawler. Not someone who's, who's quick to fight and argue. Not covetous. Not desiring the things that others have. Being content, right? One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Perfect sense. If I can't even run my own house, how can I run the church of God, the household of God? Not a novice, meaning he's not a recent convert. Lest being lifted up, yep, only men, with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Notice, a recent convert may get so puffed up with the authority given to him that he may then end up shipwrecking his own faith due to his conceit and arrogance. And some take the last part of the sentence to mean not being condemned by Satan, but experiencing the same condemnation that Satan did. So here we get an idea of why Satan, the devil, was condemned. Because the devil was conceited and proud and arrogant about the things he had, which were given to him by God, and that arrogance led to his condemnation. So here you get an idea of the nature of the devil's sin. Why was the devil condemned by God? Because he too became conceited. And he had no right to be conceited because everything he had, everything he was, was given to him by God. God made him that way. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. Catch it? Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. And then even outsiders speak highly of him. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay, now, that's the qualification of a bishop. What about a deacon? 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. What about a deacon? 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. Okay, now watch this. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, double-minded, speaking out of both sides of your mouth, saying one thing to one person and another thing to another, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience, right? Knowing what you believe, being persuaded of what you believe, and living it, and not paying lip service to it and pretending to be living it, right? And let these also first be proved. Test them. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Now, verse 11 is a little more controversial. Verse 11 seems to suggest that it's talking about the wives of the deacons. I'm going to show you that's not necessarily the case. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faith in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, let's unpack verse 11. Literally, verse 11 says, Even so must women be grave. The word there is not in the Greek text. That's why if you read a printed copy of the King James Bible, you'll see that the word there is in italics. Words italicized in the King James Bible are indication that these words are being supplied, they're not in the text. Literally, 1 Timothy 3.11 says, even so, the woman, it doesn't say their women, their wives, because the word there is not there. You with me there? That sounded that, almost like I rhymed, right? The word there is not there. You with me there? Okay. Let me show you what I mean. Let me get you alternate translations. Hold on. Can you post the Greek for us for, uh, first and the last? Can you post the Greek for us first and last? Here. Let me do this. Yeah. Here you go. Let me show you. ESV. Let's see. Let me find the translation. Okay. All righty then. 
let's look at let's look at the CEB, Common English Bible. Okay, watch here. Gonaikas, 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 Gonaikas. I'm trying to learn the pronounce Greek. Gonaikas. The word Gonai in Greek can mean woman or wife. Woman or wife. You know, watch here. Yes, Grace, you're right. First Timothy three eleven is talking about the qualification for female deacons. Exactly. Here it is, Common English Bible. In the same way, women who are servants in the church should be dignified and not gossip. They should be sober and faithful in everything they do. The evidence strongly shows that First Timothy three eleven is talking about women. Hey, Chad, why are you on my YouTube link if you don't like the venom that I spew against hypocrites and heathens like you? If you don't like my venom, why are you here, you wicked, vile hypocrite? You see, I'm going to give you a taste of your own medicine. Chad, now can you take a hike, friend? Am I an elder? That's one of the reasons I'm not an elder, because I would beat someone like you into repentance. See, I beat the flock. Right, so hit the road, Chad. Don't come back no more, no more, no more, no more. What a vile hypocrite. He's coming and listening to me and attacking me, saying, How dare you? Strike against an elder. Well, that's why I'm not an elder. Neither should he, he should he. Anyway. All right, hold on. Let's come back here. Sorry about that. Now, what was I saying before I got distracted? Okay. First Timothy 3.11, the word gunai can mean wife or woman, but in the context, it's not speaking of the wives of deacons. It's talking about women who are also deacons. Now, how do I know that? Let me explain to you how I know this. If it's talking about the wives of deacons, we would expect to find that something would be said about the wives of bishops, right? Why mention the qualifications of the wife of a deacon and not mention the qualification of a wife of a bishop, right? Everyone with me there? Why do I believe that 1 Timothy 3.11 is not talking about the wives of deacons, but female deacons? That women who are called to become deacons in the church, that they must meet a certain standard before they can qualify. Well, number one, if it's speaking of the wives of deacons, we'd expect something similar to be said about the wives of bishops, right? Now notice how the NIV renders this. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Is everyone with me? You understand? If it's not about the wives of deacons, why not also just the wives of bishops? Number one. Number two. Women can be deacons, but they cannot be bishops. Sorry, folks. Those of you who are egalitarian who may disagree. A bishop is a man, but a deacon can be a man or a woman. Why? Because, again, we have evidence from the New Testament and actually early church history that shows that females did assume the office of deacons but not bishop. This comes from the New Testament, and it comes from outside the New Testament. How many of you read Pliny the Younger's letter to the emperor as he was discussing his interrogation of Christians? Have you read that letter? When he mentions Christians, as he's writing to to the emperor, Pliny was the was the governor of Bithynia, and he's writing a letter to the emperor, and he's talking about the interrogation of Christians, right, and how he tried to force them to come back to the worship of the Roman gods. Now, how many of you recall that in that letter, he mentions, Pliny mentions, that he interrogated two of their female deacons, Two female deacons of the church. He interrogated them. So here you have extra biblical evidence from a pagan governor who confirms that at that time churches had female deacons. Did you know that? Do you want me to get you that reference? Or do you guys can do your own Google search and find it? Okay. So we have early support. Early support. Both from the New Testament, such as Romans 16, 1, 1 and 2, 
and extra biblical sources that there were female deacons functioning in the church. And yet you won't find any reference to a female bishop because a bishop stands in the place of Christ. Since Christ is the husband of the church, you cannot have a woman representing the husband, the role of a husband, right? Is that clear? But what are deacons? Servants who serve the church and the bishops or place an authority over them. There you go. Petar quoted it. Thank you, brother. From Pliny the Younger, the governor of Bithynia, as he's writing to the emperor. Thank you. Here's the citation. Accordingly, I judge it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves called deaconesses. So the evidence is solid that there was an office for female deacons, but there was no office for female bishop. Now, coming back to the issue, how many offices do we see assigned to the local church? Two, bishop slash overseer slash elder and deacon. And the office of deacon could be occupied by a male or female, right? Everyone getting it? You're seeing this? Just before I move on, it's not putting you to sleep, right? I hope it's blessing you and edifying you for the glory of Jesus Christ to learn a little bit about the church structure. Okay, now, let me show you how important the office of an elder is. Let's look at the book of Acts. Wherever Paul went, and he spent considerable time with a group that he converted, once he saw someone among the group that showed signs of spiritual maturity, he would then appoint that someone to be the elder, the leader, the overseer of that group as Paul then would move on. So Paul made sure when he established churches by the grace of God's spirit that either he'd re remain behind or leave someone behind long enough to teach them the core doctrines and then judge whether there were people among them who were showing signs of spiritual maturity that they were mature enough to then become the elder of that particular group. Let's go to Acts 14, 23. Let's look at that. How important the role of elder is for a local assembly of believers. Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, see what Paul would do? He would make sure to find mature believers qualified to be elders and ordain them for every church that he planted by the grace of God's Spirit. And I prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. See it here? It's not the only time. That's Acts 14, 23, right? Let's see who Paul summons from Ephesus. Acts 20, 17. Acts 20, 17. Acts 20, 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Elders of the church. Who do you call for? The elders presiding over the care of the church. And then he gives them final instructions. Now notice what some of these final instructions happen to be. Acts 20, 27 to 32. Acts 20, 27 to 32. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now he's talking to the elders now. Elders, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, hath made you overseers. Do you see that? An elder is an overseer, is a bishop. But notice what Paul says. Paul did not appoint them to be elders. The Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit used Paul through Paul appointed elders for the church you see it it is the holy ghost the holy spirit that made you an overseer a bishop and elder i didn't make you one the spirit did and the spirit used me right and revealed to me which of you was appointed by the spirit to be an overseer a bishop and elder of the church now why did god raise up bishops here's the answer folks to feed the church of god spiritually which he hath purchased with his own blood. So God has blood, because here it's not about the God man, Jesus Christ. God became flesh, and by his blood, he redeemed a church and then raised up elders to feed his church. 
It's not their church. It's God's church entrusted to the care of the elders. Notice the responsibility of elders. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So now, why did God raise up qualified leadership? To feed the flock spiritual food, and to protect the flock from false teachers and perverts whom Satan would bring to deceive them and scatter them. That's the responsibility of elders. But can I ask you a question? How can an elder protect his flock defend his flock from false teachers if he does not know the faith so a prerequisite necessary qualification of an elder is that he must know the faith thoroughly in order to be able to explain and defend it in light of that how many elders out there meet this qualification how many of them Know the faith that well to defend it for the glory of Christ in order to protect the flock. They're there because God is faith is almighty. He will raise up qualified eldership. But the point is not every elder is truly an elder appointed by the Spirit. Right? In fact, Light, by personal experience, can testify to this, right? Light, you pretty much walked away from the faith at 18 because the pastors were not able to answer your questions, correct? What a contrast to the early church fathers. People don't know that many of these fathers were bishops, like Irenaeus, a bishop who was a bishop of a local church, church in France, who also wrote detailed defenses of the truth against heretics. So was Athanasius, so was Alexander, so was Augustine, right? What a difference in the elders of the past to some of the elders today, right? Isn't that amazing? Patar and Christian Prince, are you following me, right? <clears throat> Just want to make sure. So let's read 31, 32. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I spent three years with you elders to make sure you knew the faith inside and out and you were thoroughly qualified. Notice another thing. Elders were not sent to Bible colleges and seminaries to learn the faith. That was the work of the apostles and the work of elders. In other words, the apostles thoroughly trained the elders in the faith so they could know it inside and out. And then those elders would then train, train their successors to know the faith inside and out so that your education of the Bible would come from the qualified leadership in your church not from professors in colleges and seminaries. You catch it? Paul personally spent three years with these elders, making sure they knew the faith inside and out. And then they would then teach that faith thoroughly to their members and to their successors, those elders that would replace them. What has happened to the church today that now churches look for people who've gone to college and seminary and then interview them to see if they meet the standard before hiring them instead of raising up bishops from their own midst. What a sad state of affairs the American church finds itself in, right? Is it sad or what? Now, I don't know how they do it in the Coptic church, Christian princess, but do the Coptics appoint elders from their own midst or... Do they have a college or seminary that they go to? I don't know. I have no idea. I really don't know. So I'm just wondering how that structure is set up. Anybody know? Okay, well, you but you are associated with Coptic Christians, right? Or you're just Orthodox? Plain Orthodox. I thought you knew Coptic priests. Okay, okay. Well, okay. Or Orthodox. How do the Orthodox do it? Do they raise qualified deacons and bishops from their own midst? Or do they get them from their seminaries? Okay. Well, that said, let me reiterate the point. The only two offices you'll find connected with the local assembly of believers is that of bishop slash overseer slash elder. 
and deacons. And the office of deacon could be occupied by a male or a female, not just a male, whereas bishops were limited to males. You do not find an office of priesthood separate from the laity. You do not find an office of cardinals. You do not find an office of patriarch. You do not find an office called the Pope. These offices are not found in the New Testament or the early church. These are offices that were developed, right, invented centuries later. They're not in Scripture. Archdeacon, Arch, you don't find that. Now, what you do find, here's where, again, I'm going to highlight the inconsistency of James White. No offense, but I have to speak the truth of love. What you do find early on is what's called the monarchical episcopate. Fancy terms, I know. What does that mean? You find early on, and there's evidence in Revelation to support this, where among the group of elders, one of them would be appointed to be chief over the rest. So you would have a chief elder bishop presiding over a group of elders, presiding over a group of deacons. So it was a three-layered structure, three-tire, right? Bishop, elders, and deacons. And the evidence for that is in the letters of Ignatius. Ignatius, a disciple of the apostles, the bishop of the church in Antioch, Syria, wrote seven letters to different churches on his way to being martyred in Rome. And we have those letters preserved by the grace of God. And those letters can be read online. In all the churches, with the exception of Rome, he mentions the structure of bishop, elders, and deacons. And he exhorts the Christians to submit to the bishop as to Christ. Now, you know why that's significant? Because he himself was a bishop of the church in Antioch. But the reason why this is significant, and here's the reason. Since Ignatius is a disciple of the apostles, and since he's writing between 107 and 112 AD, within a generation after, or no, within a decade after the martyrdom, well, let me correct myself. John, according to church tradition, John the Apostle wasn't martyred. Although tortured and exiled, he died naturally. Natural causes, he wasn't martyred. He's the only apostle that we know of that wasn't martyred for the glory of Christ. And now, within a decade after the death of the Apostle John, we have Ignatius mentioning this three-tier, three-layered structure. Bishop, elders, and deacons. Now, if he's an eyewitness to the apostles, and he was appointed by the apostles, then that means this structure must have come from the apostles. Everyone with me? Otherwise, we're going to have to assume that even an eyewitness to the apostles diverged so greatly from the structure appointed by the apostles. So that means you have solid basis to argue for what's called a monarchical episcopate, where you have a bishop, chosen among these elders, to be ruler of the elders. Then you have elders and deacons. So it's a three-tier structure. Bishop, elders, and deacons. Now, why do I mention the inconsistency of James White? Here's why. Not to pick on him. God forgive me if it sounds like that. But because he's quite influential and popular, he will cite Ignatius to show that even within a decade after the last apostle, the church had a very highly exalted view of Christ, affirming that Christ is the eternal God born of the Virgin Mary. So he'll cite Ignatius for that point, but then will reject Ignatius's testimony to this three-layered structure of church authority because James White believes in a plurality of elders. He does not subscribe to a monarchical episcopate and does so inconsistently. Is this handling the church fathers responsibly? Or is this selectively picking and choosing what you like? Can you help me help me on that one? Now he'll say, oh, but I don't swear by Ignatius. My authority is the New Testament. And I only quote Ignatius when what he says agrees with the New Testament. Well, let me now respond to that. Number one, show me anywhere in the New Testament that when the apostles appointed elders, that among these elders, they would not have chosen one particular elder to be their head. In other words, this assumes that the structure envisioned by Ignatius that was already 
the standard practice in the churches that he wrote to and some of the churches he wrote to are churches that Paul preached to and wrote to like he wrote a letter to the Ephesians okay this assumes that this structure of Ignatius is not anchored in the New Testament but then that again raises the question are you telling me that someone who knew the Apostles and these churches that were installed by the Apostles all of them agreed to a structure that contradicts the very writings of the Apostles and these churches are not churches that established a structure a hundred years after the of the Apostles 20 years after the Apostles but within the lifetime of the Apostles without the Apostles doing anything to correct it really is that what you want me to believe but beyond that who says that structure goes against the New Testament teaching can you show me anywhere in any of the New Testament writings that the group of elders would not and did not appoint one elder among them to be their chief can you show me that they want me there you understand my argument you can't which leads me to my third point there is evidence to suggest from Revelation itself that this monarchical monarchical episcopate was already functioning in the lifetime of the Apostles which we already can prove from Ignatius's letters because the churches he writing to were established churches like his letter to the Ephesians well the church at Ephesus was established in the 60s by Paul and yet in this church Ignatius presupposes the structure of bishop elders and deacons and this was the standard structure among all these churches with the exception of Rome because when he's writing to Rome he doesn't mention a bishop in Rome which poses problems for Roman Catholics but that's another topic for another time we have evidence from Revelation for this monarchical episcopate a chief elder bishop presiding over the congregation did you know that we have evidence for it in in Revelation did we lose first and last or here I don't see it oh he's here let me show you Revelation 2 Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7 Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7 unto the angel of the church of Ephesus angel singular to the church of Ephesus okay we'll skip we'll skip the rest now put Revelation 2 8 unto the angel of the church of Ephesus watch the Lord has John writing to the angel Revelation 2 8 unto the angel of the church in Smyrna notice again he's not writing to the congregation but to the angel of the congregation okay Revelation 2 12 unto the angel of the church in Pergamos okay Revelation 2 18 and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira did you notice the repeated pattern to the angel to the angel to the angel singular 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 right what about Revelation 3 1 unto the angel of the church in Sardis Revelation 3 7 unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia finally Revelation 3 14 unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans did you catch it now here's my question this is where people get confused you see the word angel you assume a spirit creature right the word angel in Greek as well as Hebrew means messenger that's all it means now let me ask you a question do you want me to really believe that John is writing in a physical book a scroll and sending it to a spirit creature so that scroll will be handed to a spirit creature so that spirit creature can read it is that who John is writing to or should we assume that the angel of the church is a human messenger appointed to overlook the church? A human messenger, a human reader, a human authority. But notice that in each church it's only one. Not to the angels of the church at Smyrna, to the angel, the messenger, one for each of the seven churches. You want me there? 
Doesn't this support the monarchical episcopate that was already established before Ignatius wrote to the seven churches in 170 AD? That here you have evidence for a presiding bishop, an elder who would be the chief of all the other elders and the deacons, so that this structure mentioned by Ignatius is a structure anchored in the teachings of the apostles and the inspired writings that left behind? If so, then this is what you find for local assemblies. A bishop, which you would call a pastor, elders underneath him, and deacons. And that's it. These are the only offices connected with the local churches. There is no office of priest distinct from the priesthood shared by all believers. There is no office of cardinal. There is no office of pope. There is no office of patriarch. None of those other offices are found in the New Testament and the early writings of the Christians. Right? But again, let me remind you, this is why you have to be careful from whom you learn. And don't take anything anyone says, especially me, for granted. Prayerfully ask the Spirit to guide you to see all truth for the glory of God and affirm it. Again, I'm going to remind you the inconsistency of James White. And I hope he hears this. He will quote to you Ignatius to show that Ignatius, a disciple of the apostles, an eyewitness within a decade from the death of John, had a very high Christology. And he often quotes him in his debate with Muslims. Very high Christology, right? That Jesus is eternally God for Ignatius, showing you this was the belief of the true Christians. But then he'll ignore Ignatius's monarchical monarchical sorry episcopate structure one chief bishop ruling over elders ruling over deacons because he does not subscribe to that structure but he believes in a plurality of elders and deacons why the inconsistency can you explain that to me this is why over time by the grace of god's spirit i've grown grown very cold towards him and his arguments and his scholarship so if you stay with james white you're going to have a very superficial level of understanding. you got to go beyond him and study others, <clears throat> the giants of the faith that God has raised up for the edification of believers. Is that clear? Right? Is that clear? Alex hit it. I love that, Alex. Alex said, Jesus meet her between God and man because okay. Alex, I'm just reading your comments here on the live stream. You go, so true. He quotes Catholics and cites their councils. Yep. All right. You see my point, guys? You cannot take anything anyone says for granted, not even me. As much as he loved me, I still can be mistaken. I still have issues, sins I struggle with, and my knowledge is imperfect. Take what I offer you. Go back, prayerfully study it. And trust the spirit to bring you to all truth, right? But now to answer the question to Pataran Christian Princess, the structure we find in the New Testament early church is bishop, elders, and deacons. That's it. Exactly, Jesus Savior. Bishop, elders, deacons. That's it. Some will argue, well, the word for elder, presbyteros, in time, right? The word presbyter, in time. <clears throat> took on the meaning of priest. So a presbyter is priest. Have you heard that argument? I've heard some people make it, specifically Roman Catholic apologists. Have you heard it? Well, the word presbyter over time, right, became synonymous with priest. Part of its definition became priest, right? So that presbyter was a priest. How many of you heard that argument? I've heard it. You know what the problem with that is? That the word presbyter in the Greek New Testament, presbyteros, presbyteros, that's the word for elder, is never used with the sense of priest. It never means priest in the New Testament. So although the word presbyter may have in time adopted the word priest as part of its definition, this is what we call a chronological fallacy, an anachronistic fallacy, because that doesn't tell me what the word meant in the first century context, especially in Koine Greek. In Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament, written in the first century, 
Presbyteros does not mean priest. It means elder. The Greek New Testament has a word for priest, and it's not presbyteros, from which we get presbyter. Let me prove it to you. Are you ready? Let me show you what the word is. Let me give you blueletterbible.org. Okay, hold on. Thank God for modern technology. And I'll be done with this point. Okay. Let me show you what the word is for priest. For priest. Okay. And the Greek New Testament. It's not presbyteros from which you get presbyter slash elder. It's a different word altogether. Here, let me get it for you. Uh -oh. Why do I keep making this mistake? And I think I'll be done. I was going to deal with Shabir, but this took up more time than I thought. Okay, hold on. Presbyteros. Guys, bear with me as I try to get it. Here you go. This is the Greek word for priest. Yep. Hedios. Sorry for my mispronunciation. Hedios. There's the link. Right. Here it goes. Let's hear it. Strong's G, 2409, Hierus, Hierus. I said Hierus, he said Hierus, Hierus. Here it goes again. Strong's G, 2409, Hierus, Hierus. Now, the Holy Spirit could have simply inspired the New Testament authors to mention an office of priest. So it would have been bishops, elders, priests, and deacons. Now, why didn't the Holy Spirit do that? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire the New Testament authors to mention this distinct office of priest along with the offices of bishops and deacons if the Holy Spirit wanted this distinct office of priesthood to function in the local gathering of believers? Why did he do that? Can someone tell me? Because, to ask the question, answer it. Because there is no distinct office of priest. The priesthood is a common office shared by all believers born of the Spirit. We're all priests called to offer spiritual sacrifices if we're born of the Spirit and united to Christ. Here's the proof. 1 Peter 2, 5. And we're almost done. 1 Peter 2, 5. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. See, we're all holy and called to be priests offering sacrifices to God, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. I hope this blessed you, edified you, challenged you to think more deeply about the structure of the church according to the New Testament. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. 1 Peter 5, 9 to 10. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. If I said that, I'm sorry. I meant Revelation. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us all those he redeemed, not just some, not a distinct office, and has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. I hope it's clear. I hope you see the evidence. Again, Christian princess, Pitar, every one of you. There is absolutely no shred of evidence from the inspired New Testament. For an office of priesthood distinct from the common priesthood shared by all believers. The only offices are bishops slash elders slash overseers. Same office. And deacons. Now, the evidence supports that a deacon can be a male or female, but not a bishop. And the evidence also supports that among these elders, one was assigned to be the chief elder, the presiding bishop, over the rest of the elders as they ruled over the deacons. That's it. No more, no less. Is that clear? Light everyone else, is that clear? Any objections? Any comments? Any questions? And now let me call you back on teaching. I'll call you in a minute. Yep. 
Yeah, you can do that. I mean, Archbishop Chief Bishop, that's it. If it's clear, then my time is up. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. We adore you. We worship you. Lord Jesus, fight for us, Lord, please. Lord, every one of us have issues, struggles, and needs. You know them. You are God. You are almighty. You live. You are real. More real than we can imagine. Reveal yourself to us, Lord Jesus, and fight for us. Help me in my situation, Lord Jesus, and save me from attacks of Satan, from depression, and fill us, fill me with the joy of your salvation. Lord Jesus, please, in your infinite power, love, and mercy, watch over us and our loved ones. In my case, preserve in your infinite might, power, and love by your precious holy blood, my precious daughters, whom I love and adore. I pray I love you more than I love them and love them more than I love myself and their mother. Save them, save us from the evil one, Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus, and fill us with your spirit. And Lord, please fight for us. We need you, Lord, and provide for us. And be with me tonight as I debate individuals who are spreading heresies. Protect us from harm and anoint us by your spirit to glorify your name. We love you, Lord Jesus. You are the Son of God. Sit and throne upon, upon our hearts. My heart, my daughter's hearts, and their mother's heart belongs to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We love you. Save us, Lord. Bless these people here who love me for your sake. Fill them with your love, your presence, your spirit. Preserve them for your glory. And have them also pray for me and with me. Because we need the church that you've given us. The spiritual body. Made up of all these individual members. You've designed it that we all depend on one another as we depend ultimately on you. So, Lord Jesus, we need you. And we need each other because we're your body. And I thank you for them. For loving me praying for me and standing with me. I pray that I'll continue to serve them for your glory. I am their servant for your sake, Lord Jesus. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Now, this session is now archived.